Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the magnificent Monday edition of The Yard. A lot to talk about. It's been a decent weekend. Been a decent weekend. It's a beautiful day here in Starkville. Not as cold. It's nice and sunny. I don't know that there's a cloud in the sky, but it's pretty cool. Not, I don't know that it's even jacket weather. Maybe a light jacket day, but it's a beautiful day here in Starkville. Hope it's a great day wherever you are today. A lot to discuss today, as always. I mean, it's like we never really get any downtime. It's always so much to discuss, which is great. And I tell you this, if, uh, if you didn't enjoy the NFL playoffs yesterday, or this weekend, you really missed out. And two amazing games yesterday, of course, Mississippi State's final chance to get uh, Bulldogs in the Super Bowl with the chance to win a ring rest with uh, Willie Gay and Chris Jones with the Kansas City Chiefs. And what a classic game we saw yesterday between the Chiefs and the Bills. What, four scores in the final, what, two and a half minutes? Ridiculous, man. It was great. It goes to overtime. 13 seconds. That's all the Chiefs had left. A couple well-designed plays, and I don't know that Andy Reid gets enough credit. He gets a lot of credit for being a great coach. I still think he may be undervalued. What a great job he's done at Kansas City. And congratulations to our friend Matt Wyatt, who is uh, – the only real long-suffering Kansas City fan that I know in my circle of friends, you know, for years and years and years, he was just kind of an also-ran type, uh, you know, fan in many respects. You know, he was always with them whether they won big or not. Well, they're winning big now. Well, speaking of winning big, too, before we get into uh, some basketball stuff, Baseball America released their top 25 poll. I'm not going to break the whole thing down like we have other polls, but uh, – I like this poll. I don't like it as much as, um, you know, what we've seen from some others, especially D1 baseball is the one that I think closely aligns with my own feelings. But uh, number 25, Miami, 24, Old Dominion, 23, Texas Tech. I think that might be a little low. 22, UCLA, 21, Georgia Tech, 20, Nebraska, 19, Oklahoma State, 18, UC Irvine, 17, Tennessee, 16, North Carolina State. That's probably among the lowest that I've seen the Wolfpack. They did, they did lose some pieces. It'll be interesting, but uh, they do a great job up there. East Carolina, 15. Georgia, 14. You know Georgia's going to have pitching. Arizona, 13. And I'm interested to see what those guys do this year, you know, without Jay Johnson. Uh, it's been a, a bit of a change there. They've had some players leave. Florida State ranked 12th. I am not on the Seminoles bandwagon. I know some other people really expect a lot from them. And I think some of that, too, is just kind of you know, the lack of weight in that conference. The ACC has traditionally been a very strong baseball conference. And Florida State has kind of benefited you know, from being the, the, you know, the cream of that group. I just don't know. I don't know. They're, they're not, in my mind, they're not 12th. They went from unranked to 12th. I don't know. They got hot late last year. Oregon State 11, LSU 10. The Tigers are going to be awfully interesting this year. That lineup is going to be difficult to deal with. It really is. Number nine, Ole Miss. Number eight, Arkansas. Number seven, Stanford. There are some people out there that have Stanford as a uh, national championship contender. I think that's probably fair. Number six, Florida. You remember Florida had to really work hard to get into the tournament last year and got bounced out pretty quickly. They still return a lot of pieces, and and they will have pitching. Number five, Virginia. I think that's probably the highest I've seen them ranked. I think that's probably a little bit high. They lose a ton off that team, especially pitching-wise. Number four, Notre Dame. I believe that's the highest I've seen uh, those guys. Link Jarrett and them do a great job. Again, they lost some big pieces last year. They're going to defend well. It'll be interesting to see what their resume looks like having to play a full non-conference schedule. Uh, your Bulldogs, number three. I believe that's the highest they're rated. Mississippi State ranked third. The defending national champion, Diamond Dogs, number three. Vanderbilt, number two. I just don't buy the Vanderbilt hype. I, I don't. I've said that religiously throughout these uh, ranking recaps. I just don't think that they're going to be one of the best teams in the country. They're going to be great, but they're not going to be what they have been. You know, even last year we saw, even with two front-line pitchers with uh, Kumar and Leiter, uh, they still were kind of, you know, up and down a bit. 
didn't win the SEC last year, made it to Omaha, played for a national championship. You can say, well, Steve, you know, you're, you're talking kind of poorly, those guys. And they, uh, they played in the final game of the year, and they did. But they've lost a lot. You don't lose two first-round arms on the SEC weekend and get better as a team, not even if you're Vanderbilt, not even if you've got 100 scholarships. It just doesn't work that way. And some of the guys they're counting on on a weekend are some guys at Mississippi State rock pretty good. And then, of course, number one, Texas. I agree with this. I know many of you think, Steve, we should be homers and we should have state number one because they are the defending NAFL champions. And you know what? We're in striking distance at number three. But Texas, number one, I would have Texas number one. I've said that throughout this offseason. I think Texas is an interesting team. The issue with them is going to be swing and miss in that lineup. A ton of swing and miss in that lineup. Can they be a little bit better and have some play discipline this year? Can they cut the strikeouts down? Can they put the, put the ball in play? They're a very athletic team. They did lose some pieces, but I think they are probably the most complete team in the field right now. A lot to kind of figure out for sure. And that's what makes it all fun. We talk about it at this point, kind of get excited. But uh, Mississippi State, a consensus top 10 team. Mississippi State, a team that uh, within striking distance of number one. But here's the deal. We've talked about this before. You know, we've been number one several times in our history. We've only been number one at the end of the year once, and that was last year. Can this Bulldog team compete for a national championship? I believe they can. Can this Bulldog team win a NFL championship? I believe they can. Will they? That remains to be seen. But I do think State is in a very good position to be a host team and potentially be a top eight this year, which, of course, would give the Bulldogs an opportunity to host a Super Regional round as well, and that's going to depend on matchups. But if I had to call it today, yeah, I'd pick State to be in Omaha. And then from there, it just kind of depends on how, how, things, uh, how things work out. Last year, we got a very – advantageous draw in many respects but uh, you know that Texas team was a good team last year they were a great team last year Mississippi State was just better just a little bit better and you know I think about you know the poetry behind all of this you know and and I write about this in Dogpile which will be released later this week if you're looking to order you can do so at dogpilethebook.com that's d-a-w-g pile the book.com Uh, Supposed to ship out on or around the 26th, which is Wednesday. Not sure if that means we get books to the publisher on Friday, because it takes a couple days. And if so, I'll spend the weekend signing your books, and then they'll be mailed out early next week. So if you've not ordered, now's a good time to do it. But one of the things that I mentioned is, you know, when you think about exercising, you're kind of the ghost of Diamond Dog Seasons Past. That's what made beating Texas the more apropos you know that had been the team you know people forget in 84 Texas got us in 84 you know in 85 we're cruising along there I went away from playing for an AFL championship and then Gene Morgan gets it I interviewed Gene when I was in Omaha but you had to get Texas I, I think in order to kind of close the loop you had to at some point take Texas out we did I know many of you remarked about uh, the emotion the Longhorns showed after the ball game was over. And again, I have so much respect for that program, and how can you not? And lead all of college baseball in uh, NCAA college baseball tournament appearances. They're a great baseball team. But you know what? We're a great baseball team. And so we exercise that demon, and then we get our familiar foal within our own league, which is Vanderbilt. It's a good rivalry between State and Vanderbilt. It really is. You know, people forget 2018, we went up there and won a Super Regional at their place. Probably could have argued that we should have hosted that thing. You know, Jake and those guys finally break through and get to Omaha. You know, then 2019, we had a great team, and, you know, they get us. You know, we play them in Hoover, and we lose a one nothing ball game. And really, we lose one nothing. I believe we let, a, we let a fly ball drop, probably got caught a little bit in between, took the more conservative play, probably should have made a catch there. But the bottom line is, is that we have been a team that has competed very well with Vanderbilt. There have been times they've gotten us, we've gotten them. But it only made sense. You take care of Texas for the earlier generation. You take care of Vanderbilt for this generation. So, again, there we are now, beginning of the year, one, two, three. And it's crazy when you start looking at this top ten. It's pretty ridiculous. 
right? We played everybody in the top 10 other than Stanford. Let's let that sink in for a second. Absolutely played everybody uh, that is a consensus top 10 team this year. That's LSU, Ole Miss, Arkansas. Didn't play Stanford. We lost to Florida, of course, in, uh, in uh, Hoover. And then, of course, uh, you know, Virginia, Notre Dame. Virginia, we beat them, you know, of course, in, in uh, pod play, pool play, excuse me, in Omaha. And then we take down Notre Dame in the Supers. So we're all right there together. And I think, uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. When you begin to kind of break some of these teams down, you say, well, you know, they're going to have to have some guys step up pitching-wise. And that's the same. That's the case for us, too. You know, LSU lost a ton of pitching. They had some transfers in. Ole Miss lost a ton of pitching. Arkansas lost some pitching. Uh, Florida lost pitching. Virginia lost pitching. Notre Dame uh, lost some pitching, but really lost, uh, you know, some production offensively as well. Vanderbilt lost a ton of pitching. And Texas lost some pitching. That, that's the issue. The teams that can find a consistent third starter and guys that can get production at the bottom third of their order are going to make it to Omaha. That's how college baseball works. I don't worry as much about our order as I do our, our rotation. You know, we know Landon Sims is going to be the Friday night guy. Could be Preston Johnson on Saturday. Could be Jackson Fristo. Could be Kate Smith. Uh, could be Wallen. You know, we'll see. I know some people are expecting him to start. I've read some comments here as of late that aren't really rooted in fact, you know, about how Walling has, you know, really done well since he's been here. He really hadn't. He was banged up in the fall. Uh, so we need we need a good preseason from him. And, you know, he may be a guy, too, that starts out in the bullpen and then kind of graduates to the weekend rotation uh, over time. Maybe he starts out in the bullpen, becomes a midweek starter, and then maybe by the time uh, we get ready to open SEC play, maybe he's ready to go for the weekend. But, you know, a lot of pro scouts see him as a back-of-the-bullpen type guy, whether it be a setup guy or a closer. Does he become your closer? I mean, I know he came here to start, but is the, does that become the reality for him and us? You know, we'll see. It's fun talking baseball. And, you know, again, we're, you know, we're under a month now. You know, under a month. We're going to be ready to get out there and go to Dirty Noble Field. I can't wait. I know you guys are, are eager to see Long Beach State come in here too. And, again, that's going to be – you know, pretty much a top 25 team across the board. Baseball America didn't rank them in the top 25, but just about everybody else did. So, you know, we'll get a chance pretty early on to get tested. And I think that's really you know, the, the challenge for Mississippi State is the pitching aspect of it, is test this rotation, test the middle innings, those middle relief guys. Is Parker Sinatra guy on the back end? That's what we got to kind of identify. So, uh, we're not going to get a chance to kind of ramp things up. We're going to go right into the gate and go play a great Long Beach State team, a team that uh, a lot of people expect to be in the tournament and, of course, uh, kind of contending uh, for a potential hosting location. So so there you go. Quick look at the Baseball America poll. I think that's probably all the major polls that are out. You know, they'll have the top 25 coaches poll or whatever. But at the end of the day, again, I, I defer more to the D1 baseball poll like those guys at Baseball America a lot. But, I, but more times than not, the D1 baseball poll is kind of usually matches my own perceptions and my own opinions, even though at times I think they overvalue Florida. And it's like so many times it's like we're just waiting for – like, oh, my gosh, at some point Florida's going to get it together. So we don't want to drop them too much and have this big yo-yo effect. I, I don't know that, um, that maybe they get an unbiased – view of things at times I you know that's just my personal opinion you know you would think you know Florida being in a baseball crazy state like Florida would always be able to sign top 10 classes and be a you know a top 10 team a team that competes for the SEC championship hadn't always been that way though hadn't always you know and and we, we recently had a discussion over on Gene's page you know is Mississippi State a top five baseball program all time and it's not it's not, and that's me being objective about that as I can be. We've got one NAFL championship. We're not in the top five programs all time. Are we in the top five programs right now? Yeah, absolutely we are, but all time, no. And so when you do the math on that, I would say state some – I've got state 10th. I actually ran the numbers myself. I've got state right there at 10th. I think 10th, 11th, 12th, maybe at the lowest. But your Bulldogs a perennial top 15 team all time. When you begin to kind of break – NCAA tournament appearances, Omaha appearances. You know, we played for a national championship a couple of times. All of that is very important. All of it is important. And that's the thing, and I wrote about this in Dogpile. Mississippi State's always been good at baseball. You know, we've had a couple of years here and there where maybe we hadn't been as great as we'd like to be. 
But from the very beginning, we were a great baseball program. We have always valued our play on the diamond. That's why people come to play here. They come to play here because, number one, our administration and our fan base support college baseball. It is an incredible relationship between the fans and the team and the coaches here. It's absolutely incredible. And, you know, they have some of that other places. But the thing that you'll find is that, uh, you know, when there are games to be played, our people are going to turn out. Our people make it an event. It makes it special. And, and one of my favorite memories of last year, you know, it's the group from Campbell that came in and were kind of adopted as our second favorite team in the regional, you know, walking around after and then talking to their parents and talking to some of the players about how remarkable the experience was. And then basically seeing the same thing happen with Notre Dame, you know, a team that was a great team last year. I don't know how great they were because I don't know if we get the full body of, uh, of work without a non-conference schedule. My point being is that teams, even in defeat, have a great experience at Duty Noble Field. And you guys are a big reason for that, huge, because they know they're going to come here and play a baseball game that matters. There are a lot of teams that play at home and you know, play in front of maybe 100, 200 fans. I mean, you look at Oregon State, they've been a national power the last, uh, you know, this generation. You turn on there and it's like, oh, we've got a record crowd of 2,500. That's a Tuesday for us, you know. So when teams come in here, they know they're going to see college baseball at its absolute finest. Let's thank our good friends at Bulldog Burger Company. Love those folks. I was a fan of Bulldog Burger Company, I think, before they were fans of mine. And you should be as well, of both of us. But Bulldog Burger Company is going to feed you. I'll feed your, uh, your thirst for knowledge. They're going to feed your physical appetite. I love eating there. Anytime somebody says, hey, Steve, I'm going to be in town, let's go to lunch. How about Bulldog Burger Company? I'm like, hey, even though the company sometimes should always be a little bit better than the cuisine, it's pretty great to be able to go to a great place, have a great meal with a great friend. Bulldog Burger Company is usually my restaurant of choice when it comes to that sort of stuff because I like to turn you guys on. If you've never been, you got to have those spring rolls because I don't want to sit there and look at an average-looking person. I want you to be better looking. You have those spring rolls. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. Had a guy tell me the other day he'd never had his spring rolls before. The next thing you know, he gets in the car, looks in the rearview mirror, didn't recognize himself. Makes a big difference, man. It really does. It's science. We trust the science on this show. Be sure and go check them out today. Have that great restaurant-quality hamburger. It is one of the fine delicacies you'll have in life. You can find them in three great places. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, and then the brand new one, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Getting a lot of great reports still. People that said, hey, Steve, I just finally had a chance to get over there. You know, we love it. I've had some other people that said they took their kids one time, and now once a week the kids want to go. I, don't, I think give the kids what they want. Give them what they want because you benefit from that decision too. Get that chocolate shake to go. You'll be glad you did. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. All right, let's talk men's hoops. Bulldogs pick up a big win over the weekend. And, I, and I'll say this too. I'm not calling this a big win because Ole Miss is great at basketball. You guys know are well aware Ole Miss not really very good at sports. Uh, they're not playing good basketball. But this was a big win for us because, number one, we had to kind of right the ship. And it's a rivalry game. And so give our guys some credit. Give Ben Howe and the staff some credit. We went out there and took care of business. First half was a little bit dicey at times. Yeah, I don't think you know, we, we kind of perimeter defense early in the ballgame I thought was really good. They kind of made some adjustments and got some open shots and knocked them down to kind of hang in the ballgame. But even at 42-41, you know, we're up a point at the break. I never felt like we were in trouble. I never did. It, ne- it never felt like we were in trouble. Now, of course, there's that – that familiar, you know, pit in the bottom of the Bulldog's stomach. You're like, oh, my gosh, if we lose this game, I'm not going to be able to take it. Because we all knew what was at stake. We could not absorb another bad loss like this. There are still a lot of basketball left to be played. Basically, the Bulldogs come out and take care of business, as we hoped and as they should. Said on Friday, I mean, you, know, you never know how these things are going to go. I thought Mississippi State handled it really well, especially in the second half especially on the defensive side. Really thought the Bulldogs ratcheted up their intensity on the defensive end, put together that decisive run, got some separation. And that was really the difference between Wednesday against Florida and then Saturday against Ole Miss. We got the lead against Florida, and it's like we kind of played not to lose. I really thought 
we did a better job of making shots and then turning turnovers into points late to not give Ole Miss a lot of chance uh, to breathe. Now, I'll be honest with you, there are times I think we could be a little more vicious with our killer instinct. You know, it's like once you get people on the ropes, you want to be able to finish. We don't always do a real good job with that. Um, but I thought, too, Ole Miss showed a little quit in them. I think once they realized, once we kind of took it out to double digits, they're midway through the second half. I think they realized this was going to be a game they're going to lose, another one. And tip of the cap to our crowd. Attendance announced at 9,739. I don't know if that's accurate, but it's pretty close. And I really thought once State got on a roll, the crowd got on a roll with them. And I don't care who you are or where you're from. It is only human nature to expect officials to kind of get on a roll with you. It happens. And there were some times I thought we got some calls. And, again, the team's playing well. The crowd's into the ball game. You know, all of a sudden you're going to blow a whistle. You better be sure about what you're calling. And, I, and you can say, well, you know, Stevie's guys are professionals. And, and, and they are. But it's only human nature for that to happen. And I think that's another reason why, you know, having the big crowds are an important part of things. Because people are just really don't want to make those calls unless they're absolutely sure about them. So let's take a quick look at the ball game. We talked about that de- decisive second half. And, you know, again, before we, before we kind of jump to that, you know, State, I guess, nine minutes to go in the half, the first half, you know, we get up by eight. They kind of come back and, and make it a game again, even take a lead on a Matthew Morrell three pointer. I thought we did a really good job on him defensively. Give Iverson Molinar a lot of credit. Ole Miss comes back, takes a five-point lead uh, with 4.17 to play. But State hangs in there. Tolu Smith knocks down a free throw uh, to complete an old-fashioned three-point play to tie it at 39. And then from there, you know, State uh, makes a couple baskets and gets into the locker room with that 42-41 lead. And again, while there's that part of you that's like, oh, my gosh, we can't lose this ball game, it never really felt like State was in trouble. State comes out, goes to work, really does a nice job. Again, on the defensive end, you know, we talk about the, you know, we talk about scoring. Okay, it's a 44-41 game, basically 20 seconds into the second half. 41 points for Ole Miss, right? Well, you look down here a little bit later, you play some pretty good basketball, and all of a sudden you look up and Mississippi State has got 64 points and Ole Miss has 49. Eight. Eight minutes to go in the game, and they have scored eight second-half points. That will generally win for you. State then pushes ahead then by 17. With seven minutes to go, State has a 17-point lead after a huge Garrison Bronk, uh, Brooks dunk. Thought he played well. Ole Miss tries to hang a little bit, but State never really got in a bad spot here. Even pushes it out to 19 points. D.J. Jeffries rammed home a three at the 333 mark to make it 74-55. And at this point, it was pretty much academic. I mean, it was just – you knew the game was over. It was just going to be a matter of what the final score would be. And State actually uh, expands the lead to their biggest advantage of the day to 20 points. It's 78-58 with just under two minutes to play. Ole Miss gets one more basket, and then that's the game. That's the game. Now, the big news that everybody wants to talk about is Tolu Smith. Uh, Tolu, with 116 to play, would stayed up 18. Just one of those freak things. You know, he takes a little contact to the right knee and then goes down clutching the left knee. The first thing that I thought of before they showed the replay, I said, oh, they just knock knees, he'll be okay. And then I see him out there kind of writhing in pain a little bit, and uh, that's when you get a little more concerned. And the very first thing, again, because uh, we're Mississippi State people, people automatically assume the worst. Oh, well, that's probably it for the year. Uh, based on what Ben Howen said in the post game, and based on what I have heard in the uh, last 24 to 36 hours, is he will be out this week, but he is expected to return. It'll be a day-to-day type deal. You know, they'll continue to monitor him. They'll stem it. They'll put some ice on it. You know, they'll they'll do some things to treat him, but he's he's going to be out this week. I mean, just go ahead and expect that. Could be back next week, but it could linger in the next week, right? I mean, the, the main thing is, is we've got to find a way to win games and get to the tournament. And that's the thing when you look at poor Tolu this year. It's like he's had one thing after another. One thing after another. He's cut, it's almost like he snake bit. 
And some would say, well, Steve, why is he in the game that late in the game? You know, we're up 20 points with under two minutes to go. Why not put those other people out there, reward them a little bit, let them uh, let Isaac Stansberry get out there and bomb a three, whatever. You know, I can hear that too. Uh, I think part of it too is I think sometimes you get caught up in the flow of the game and it's like it's almost a relief, you know, and maybe you get caught watching the game at times rather than coaching the game. But the reality of it is, is you never know when a guy is going to get banged up at any point in the ball game. It's easy in hindsight to say, hey, well, you know, he shouldn't have been in the game. That's easy to say now. Uh, I'd like to see us empty the bench. Doesn't get to the, we don't get to do that very often, you know. And so, uh, but the reality of it is, is that Tolu is expected to miss the week. MRI was uh, negative yesterday, which is a positive, no structural damage. So it's basically kind of a strain or a sprain or a pull or whatever. It's not – there are no tears. So we expect him back. But, again, it's like this poor kid. I mean, it's like, you know, he's kind of late getting back into good health. You know, he had off-season surgery, comes back, and then he, then he has the foot deal. And, you know, then he misses some time for non-disciplinary reasons, and you can do the math on that. Now this. You know, it's every time you turn around, it's like it's a new thing with him. And it's not his fault. I mean, it's just the reality of life. And – you know, maybe that means he comes back next year. I mean, I know that's selfish for all of us. I mean, I think what I'd like to see happen, you know, is Tolu Smith come back and, and have a healthy uh, rest of the year and lead Mississippi State maybe to the Sweet 16 and then go pro. I'd want that for him. And it's also a benefit to our program. And when you have guys coming here that can be successful and then parlay that into a pro opportunity. But, uh, again, not going to expect him to play this week. And uh, let's just call that – an educated guess. Uh, so let's look at the schedule. What's up for Mississippi State? We'll be Super Tuesday for you old timers. You remember this? Uh, we used to have Super Tuesday on ESPN. It was like the biggest marquee games of the midweek. Uh, we're going to be at Kentucky, 8 p.m. tip uh, on ESPN. I don't mean I know if that's Dig Battle there or not. And the matchup does kind of lose us a little bit of its luster without Tolu. But we're going to be on the road all week at Kentucky on Tuesday at Texas Tech on Saturday. And that's an ESPN2 broadcast. Texas Tech, the Red Raiders, you know, been a pretty good program uh, the last several years, for, you know, for sure. I don't know if you've kept up or not. Maybe you're like me. I, you know, I used to watch everything. I, I don't watch everything anymore. I used to watch college basketball every single night. There's just too many other things on now. Netflix went around back then. Uh, but the Red Raiders now 15-4, and four, and here's the big number, 12-0 and 0 at home. So Bulldogs are going to have to really earn it this week. There's no doubt about it. Uh, two road games against two very good teams. I mean, you're up arena. Uh, what else do you need me to say? I mean, you, do you need me to even preview the game? You know that Kentucky's going to bring it. And, um, you know, interesting weekend for Kentucky. I mean, I look at last week. That's the thing about Kentucky, and you give them a lot of credit. You know, they have um, – <laughs> They get everybody's best shot every time out. It's kind of like playing Mississippi State baseball or Alabama football in some respects. I mean, even though those teams are a little more accomplished than even Bulldog baseball. But the sentiment remains. People are going to bring their best efforts. And I thought John Calipari had a funny comment the other day. He said that he was going to invest in T-shirt companies because everywhere they go, it's either a white out, a blue out, an orange out, or whatever. Everybody gets a free shirt. That's respect. That is absolute respect. You know, we've done that too. We'll bring a team in. We'll give away shirts to have, have a great environment. Uh, but Kentucky, you know, loses the ballgame over the weekend. Um, again, they're 15-4 and four overall. I'd like our chances a lot better with a healthy Tolu Smith. But we have played a lot without Tolu Smith uh, this year. So it's not like all of a sudden we're going to have to kind of figure it out on the fly. But Kentucky, you know, in SEC play has been really good. They opened the SEC with a 65-60 loss at LSU. Then they pounce on Georgia. They beat Vandy at Vandy. They blow out Tennessee at their place, 107-79. And then they get at A&M. And, of course, that's when they have the you – know, it was a wild environment. A&M was game 64-58. And to be honest with you, if we're going to be competitive in this game, I think it's a game we have to keep in the 60s. I mentioned that against Florida. I don't know that we can win a game in the 70s, and you know what? We didn't. I think in order for Kentucky, we've got to slow things down and we've got to play good defense. We can't give up a lot of baskets in transition. 
But yeah, I mean, it's going to be long odds for us to win this game. I'm not, and this is not a criticism of anybody. It's just a reality of that Kentucky is better than us. Texas Tech, that's probably a pretty even matchup in many respects. You know, it's just going to boil down to how well we can play. But, you know, we're capable of going to Lexington and win a ball game. But again, you know, I'm not, my enthusiasm about Mississippi State men's basketball are not going to be impacted by Kentucky. It's not. That, I mean, that's always the team that we aspire to be, right? That's the measuring stick for everybody in this conference. And so if we go up there and lose the game, I'm not going to get on the show Wednesday and be like, oh, my gosh, the sky is falling. I'm expecting to lose the game. But I'm also expecting us to go up there and compete. Because even with or without Tola, we have some guys on this team that are willing to go out there and compete. They're not going to give up. And we have actually played Kentucky uh, well at times under Ben Howen. But without Tolu, you know, you're – one of your stars, it's going to be a difficult undertaking. Real quick look at the uh, you know the SEC weekend, in case you've uh, you've missed all that. You know, maybe, maybe you saw it all. I don't know. Maybe you kept up with everything. We actually have a uh, men's game tonight. Uh, it's the makeup game. Florida is at Ole Miss. That was, of course, to be the uh, the first game of the year uh, for the Rebels. They ended up getting postponed. So that'll be on tonight if you're looking for some uh, for some basketball to watch. Uh, Auburn, of course. Wins at home against Kentucky, 80-71. This Auburn team, you know, Bruce Pearl, arguably the coach of the year. Florida, 61-42 winners over Vandy. South Carolina, Frank Martin, who I think is probably in his last year as the head coach at Columbia. 83-66 winners over Georgia. State, of course, 78-60 winners over Ole Miss. And Tennessee, 64-50 winners at home against LSU. LSU, Tough week for them. They lose to Alabama and then lose to Tennessee. Take that, Will Wade. Alabama bounces back and uh, wins 86-76 against Mizzou. Alabama is one of those teams, too, that like once they kind of figure this thing out with their perimeter shooting, because they are so athletic, they're going to be a team you don't want to play in a tournament. And then Arkansas, 76-73 winners in overtime against A&M. A&M with an 0-2 week. And so let's take a quick look at the standings. At the top, of course, Auburn 7-0, and now with a two-game lead on the field, at the very least. Kentucky 5-2, and A&M now 4-2. and They were 4-0 and a week ago, 4-2 and now. So Mississippi State currently tied for third in the SEC. Not in the SEC West, the entire SEC. We don't break it down by divisions anymore. So State's right there at 4-2. and There's a couple things that tells me. Number one, There are a lot of teams kind of similarly situated with us. There are a lot of teams out there that are capable of beating us, but also we're capable of beating them. A lot of parity in the league once you get through really the first couple of squads. So there are some games out there you may look at as a casual Bulldog fan and say, you know what, I going to be lost. That may end up being a win. So state right there, right there, third. Arkansas is four and three. Tennessee also four and three. Alabama four and three. Everybody uh, basically a half game back. Florida three and three. That's a loss. I think that'll hang with us for a while. We're really going to feel like we let that one get away. LSU three and four. They were fifteen and zero in the non conference. Excuse me, twelve and zero in the non conference, and now fifteen and four overall. Ten and one there at the uh, PMAC. South Carolina two and four in the league. Eleven and seven overall. Vanderbilt two and four. Ten and eight overall. And then we get to the bottom of the barrel, Missouri 2-4, and 8-10. and 10. The good thing is we get a chance to play the Tigers twice. Going to need both of those. Ole Miss 1-5 and five, and now 9-9. Nine and nine. Good chance that the, uh, the Rebels dip below 500 tonight. And then Georgia 0-6, 5-14. I mean, at this point, I think it's pretty apparent you're going to have to have a coaching change there at the University of Georgia. So that's how it lays out right now. And, uh, again, now that we're kind of getting towards the halfway point in the SEC schedule, you kind of are beginning to see a little bit of separation from the elite and then from the bottom tier teams. But the middle of the pack, I mean, the difference between third place and 12th place in this league is two games. And a lot of that, too, is just mathematics. We had not played a lot of games. But there is a lot of parity in the league, which means there are some games that we're capable of winning. And, again, I still believe that we are an NCAA tournament team. It's interesting. There are some people that get they get upset with me to think, oh, Steve, you should be, uh, you know, go team rah, rah, rah all the time. Well, I am. I am. I always expect Mississippi State uh, to compete at a high level. 
even in, against teams like, you know, we're going to go play Kentucky. I expect us to go compete. I'm not a Pollyanna, though. I'm not going to say, you know what, hey, sure, we can go up there and win in Rupp Arena against Kentucky, against a nationally ranked Kentucky team without one of our best players. I, I don't expect it. I hope for it. I don't expect it. But I can support the team and also, too, kind of prepare for the possibilities. And I think it's one thing that at times we kind of struggle with, you know. Uh, and at the end of the day, too, you know, what I say or think in many respects doesn't change anything. If, if, if it boiled down to what I thought and what I hoped and what I expected, Mississippi State would be the perennial NAFL champions in every sport because I want Mississippi State to win in everything. Uh, but this is, obviously is a big year uh, at this juncture for our men's basketball team, and, and I am supportive of the team. And had we lost to Ole Miss, it would have been very detrimental to our fan support. But I, I want to give a tip of the cap, too, not just to the crowd but our students. It was incredible the, guy, the job that you guys and gals did turned out there and to make that a very great environment. The hump can be great again. There is no doubt about it. The hump can be great again. A lot of people turned out because they expected us to win that game. But more importantly, they wanted to be a part of that win, and they have been. And, again, this is not a great Ole Miss team. But any time you line up and play Ole Miss, it's a big deal in any sport. I don't care what it – I mean, think about this too. I mean, how many how many of our fans do you think have attended a Mississippi State soccer game? I have, and some of you have. But how many do you think have attended a state soccer game? And, you know, we had the Magnolia Cup. But let us win like we did this year and last year. And all of a sudden, Twitter explodes from the casual fans that their loyalty is to Mississippi State. Not necessarily to Mississippi State soccer, but they're Mississippi State fans. So they get engaged with that. It's like, hey, we beat Ole Miss. And that's the trigger, right? You know, you could line up. Let's say you put two kids together and, uh, you know, one guy's wearing a DAG jersey. The other one's wearing, you know, I don't, I don't know who, who's in the league now. I guess A.J. Brown. Um, and you sold tickets to watch those two kids play Chinese checkers. I mean, you'd have, you'd have a cheering section. You know, we don't like each other. We don't. We certainly don't like losing each other. And so, again, great job by our staff, great job by the coaches, great job by our team, and great job by our fans to turn out uh, and support. And, again, got to keep it going. Simple as that. Got to keep winning. This is a team, again, I still expect to make the tournament. We don't have a lot of margin for error, and we can't afford to lose, you know, a lot of games that are unexpected. But, you know, the opportunity for us to kind of climb the resume building ladder is there. It's all within our reach. We just have to go play. And again, it's, I go back to the Tolu Smith thing. If this was the first time that he was out this year, I would be a little more concerned. It's not obviously not advantageous to us not to have a guy that's capable of putting a double, double together every game, not be on the floor. In no way am I suggesting that. But we have learned to play without him basically for the bulk of the season. And so it's not going to be a big shock or we don't know how to handle the substitution patterns or we have to tweak the offense. It's not some big change. We have kind of grown accustomed to him not being there. And, again, that's not critical of him. That's just the reality of life. So I think that we will absorb this this week a lot better than maybe some other teams would have been able to. Uh, if I had to call it today, I, I think our best chance to win is this weekend in Lubbock. And, and you see the odds there. They hadn't lost a game at home this year. But I don't know they played a team as capable as we are either. So if we go out there and play well, and Iverson Molnar uh, can, can kind of be that facilitator on offense for us, uh, we got a shot. So we'll, see. we'll talk about the Red Raiders a little bit later in the week. But right now, you know, our focus obviously is uh, getting ready for the Kentucky Wildcats. Again, that's a Tuesday night, 8 p.m. tip on ESPN. All right, time for today's top 10 list brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's right, Close, C L O S E, Close with Blair, B L A I R.com. If you were looking to refinance your mortgage, and maybe you should, and maybe you haven't really thought about that, you've got your equity kind of built up and you're kind of working for yourself and you're thinking, you know what, I don't know that I want to do that, but yet our debt to income ratio is through the roof, and you maybe we've become paycheck to paycheck employees, and that. Maybe on Thursdays, day before payday, I mean, you, you go up there to buy lunch and you're like, you're kind of sweating it out. You know, when they swipe your debit card, you're thinking, oh my gosh, don't live that way. You don't have to. Get your equity working for you. Consolidate some debt, lower your overall monthly payment, and be able to pad yourself a little bit. Maybe put some in your savings. Maybe you want to borrow some money to put in your savings. Maybe you want to have a home improvement done. Maybe you want to put a pool in. Maybe you're going to redo the floors. There's a lot of things that you can do to add value to your home by using the equity that's available to you. 
Blair Chandler can walk you through every bit of that. And maybe you're a first-time home buyer. Maybe you said, you know what, Steve, we tried in the past. We're scared to try in the past. We don't have the money for a down payment. We don't know how to go about any of this stuff. That's cool. That's fine. That's fine because Blair can help you through that too. There are a lot of people out there that didn't have money for a down payment that were still able to get financing. Give Blair Chandler a chance to work for you. This guy's a mortgage pro. 21 years in the industry and the top 1% close ratio in the country. He works for Fairway Mortgage. Recently voted number one in customer experience. Number one. So you've got the top guy from the number one company working for you. And here's the deal. It doesn't matter who you cheer for. As long as you listen to this show, Blair is willing to give you a little bit of a cut on some of your fees. Just mention to him, whether it be by text or by call or email, that you heard about him on the boneyard. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to pay for your appraisal. How crazy is that? It's pretty wild to think about that. It's about a $500 value. It's just kind of an incentive. You know, he's like, hey, I want to take care of our people. Take care of the boneyarders. Give Blair a text or call today on his personal cell number. 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Close with Blair.com. All right, so I had a message late last week. I said, hey, Steve, I got an idea for some top 10 lists, and uh, eventually we're going to do them all. But the one that he sent me that really intrigued me, we, we were going to do this one on Friday, and then Meatloaf passed away, and, and uh, it's crazy. I, I think when it's all said and done, I probably had 20, 25 messages from you guys saying, Steve, we got to do Meatloaf today. And, you know, we did. I'm glad we did. And I had a lot of people that said, hey, Steve, I'm glad you did that today. I'm glad, hey, no matter what you had planned, this was the right thing to do. Uh, but it's cool. And so this was the original plan. You know, probably, let's, let's be honest here, okay? And I'm a metal guy. You know, I'm a guy that's you know, got dreads and tattoos and all that sort of stuff. And I got a Motley Crue license plate. You know, I'm an, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an 80s metal guy. I mean, I like the modern rock too. But who is the band of the 90s? And be honest with yourself. There's no question in my mind. And as much as I love Soundgarden and Chris Cornell... And I have a Chris Cornell leg sleeve. And I have mentioned Chris Cornell in the acknowledgments of every book I've ever written. Matter of fact, I have a chapter in, in Flim Flam that is titled in honor of a Chris Cornell song that he wrote for Temple of the Dog, Pushing Forward Back. You didn't know that, did you? A little trivia for you. So I'm a Chris Cornell freak, man. The only celebrity death that I ever really felt in my soul was Chris Cornell. But the number one band of the 90s, it's got to be the Pet Shop Boys. No, it's not the Pet Shop Boys. It's Pearl Jam. Of course it's Pearl Jam. You got come on now. We thought I was going to say Weezer. I mean, come on. It's Pearl Jam. And so my friend hits me up and is like, hey, Steve, he is on Jeans Page. He inboxed me on Jeans Page. You can do that, you know. And said, hey, what about Pearl Jam covers? Pearl Jam does a bunch of covers live. And you know what? I love the idea because some of my favorite covers from the 90s are stuff Pearl Jam did. I think Pearl Jam is the absolute best band for the 90s. And you look at their catalog, and, and uh, I love the fact that they fought with Ticketmaster to try to keep ticket prices down for fans. They've always been great advocates. They haven't really been part of the establishment. And, and I had read an article in Rolling Stone years ago about Eddie Vedder. And I don't know who wrote the article, but they said, you know, you kind of get the feeling that Eddie Vedder – despite all the notoriety and the success Pearl Jam has had, would probably be happier being like Ian from the Fug- from Fugazi. You know, he would rather be a band that is uh, kind of under the radar but culturally appreciated and has a, a huge following. Well, they do, but they don't really embrace all this corporate stuff like a lot of bands do. And I can't say I always agree with their politics. But I love the fact that uh, when they had the, um, you know, the Pearl Jam, Cameron Crowe did the big uh, documentary about 10 – what a great album that was. And Stone Gossard's walking around like in his basement. He goes, oh, yeah, there's a Grammy over there. I mean, they just that, that stuff just doesn't matter to them. The music does, the fans do. And so that's one of the things that makes these covers so great is they're honoring some of their own influences and just basically having a party with the rest of us. Uh, so a couple of honorable mentions that I want to throw out there. Uh, Sonic Reducer. Not an original Pearl Jam song. Many people think it is. It's not. It was originally recorded by the Dead Boys uh, back in part of the early 80s punk scene. I Got You, and no, it's not Sonny Cher. It's Split Ends. And this is one of those songs, too. If you listen to the original, 
and you listen to their version, they didn't just Pearl Jam it up. It was kind of already written that way. You know, it was kind of written in the Pearl Jam vein. I think it's an excellent cover. And then Waiting on a Friend by the Rolling Stones. You know, Pearl Jam opened for the Rolling Stones on a tour. How cool was that? All right, so here we go. Top 10. Top 10 Pearl Jam cover songs. Songs that they covered from other artists. You guys like cover lists? You like Pearl Jam? This should be a great list for you. Number 10, a Beatles classic. And I was recently, (laughs) it's so funny how life works. I had the coolest kids. And uh, I will take a lot of credit for that. But I have always encouraged my kids to be themselves, but also to to expand their musical horizons. That don't just get to know, you know, your your favorite artists. Get to know their influences. I mean, it's like what's crazy, too. I remember, you know, because I was such a big Aerosmith fan, pr- even prior to, you know, Permanent Vacation and all that stuff coming out, even done with Mirrors, you could hear Pearl Jam, excuse me, Aerosmith's influence in like the other music I was listening to. You know, you could hear it with Faster Pussycats. You could hear it with Motley Crue. You know, you could hear it with even Extreme and bands like that. You could hear some influence of Aerosmith. And so I think that's one of the things about enjoying the ride is not just who you love, but listen to the bands that your favorite bands love too. And so that's what this is really about. And so I'm riding around with Ian the other day and listening to his Beatles playlist. Yeah. 16 years of age, and he has a Beatles playlist. You know, I didn't even have a Beatles album at 16. And so we're riding along there, and he goes, Hey, Daddy, this is one of my favorite Beatles songs. And uh, I texted a good friend of mine who was a Beatles fanatic, and he he said, You don't know how much I love this. You don't know how happy this makes me. But he said this is one of his favorite Beatles songs, and it was actually covered by Pearl Jam. So, Ian, this one's for you. It's You've Got to Hide Your Love Away from the Beatles. Pearl Jam is an incredible rendition of that. Number nine, and a lot of people have covered this track, and I love it. I love I love the fact that people continue to cover this song, even though I prefer the original one. I don't know that MC5 gets enough credit. You you talk people talk about bands that had attitude. Go back and watch some of that MC5 footage. The hair is outrageous, okay? But MC5 had a fist in your face before it was popular, before it was cool. It's like people like. Oh, well, I like him because they kind of keep it real. That's MC5. And they were doing it in a very politically correct climate. You didn't get out there and say the things that they said. They were very irreverent. And the difference is, like, a lot of people today are agent provocateurs, and they say and do things just to get a reaction. These guys meant it. And so Pearl Jam pays homage to MC5. Going back to the debut MC5 album, it's Kick Out the Jams. Oh, and I absolutely love, love, love Kick Out the Jams. You know, Rage Against the Machine covered that too. Number eight, and a lot of people have covered this, and most people only know this, or maybe perhaps their first introduction to this song is the Jimi Hendrix version. And I submit to you, and we've had this discussion before, the Jimi Hendrix version of Bob Dylan's classic All Along the Watchtower may be the greatest cover song of all time. You could make an argument for respect for Aretha Franklin too. And most of you probably didn't know that was a cover song. Like, what? Yeah, it was an Otis Redding song. Otis Redding wrote and recorded Respect first. Aretha Franklin, of course, took it to another level. A little bit like Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You, covering Dolly Parton's classic country song. It was a huge hit in its time, too. But Pearl Jam, their version of All Along the Watchtower, also really, really cool. That's your number eight song, All Along the Watchtower. Number seven, and you might have thought this was the Rod Stewart version. And uh, what's interesting, too, because I'm an old guy. I'm from the 1900s. And um, our senior class song, you know, like everybody has like a a song. Ours was Forever Young by Rod Stewart. And I remember some people voted for You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer. Maybe we should have gone with that one. But uh, Forever Young has always been one of those songs that, uh, yeah, I've always kind of felt a little bit melancholy about. This is not that song. The Forever Young that Pearl Jam does is Bob Dylan's version, and they actually have dedicated their live versions of this song to Shannon Hoon from Blind Melon, which I think is phenomenal. And most of you obviously have a connection to Blind Melon in some respect. Number six, probably a bit of a surprise for many of you because it doesn't fit the narrative of what you think Pearl Jam should be or shouldn't be. But they covered a Van Halen song, and they uh, dug it up again uh, after Eddie died and played Ain't Talking About Love. And uh, how phenomenal is that to hear those guys play Ain't Talking About Love by Van Halen? That's number six. So, Rob, that's you. You'll be sure to enjoy that one. You probably have already knew that. 
Number five, one of the great protest songs of the 1960s in the Vietnam era. And Pearl Jam is a perfect band to cover this song. And uh, I remember playing this when I was a radio disc jockey, and I would always say, this, this is kind of my theme song these days, when they were talking about uh, starting to draft up again when we had uh, Desert Storm. You know, I was in college at the time and, and a radio DJ, and a lot of people were like, hey, you better make sure you stay in school or you're going to end up going to Iraq. And I, I kind of fell in love with this song back then, but it is one of these songs that is not just anthemic for a generation. It is one of those things I think that is timeless because there is always the haves and the have-nots. There is always those people of privilege, of true privilege, and not just perceived privilege, and then the rest of us. And there were a lot of uh, senators' sons, and you know where I'm going with this. There were a lot of people that... Um, their children were too good to go and serve. And uh, there were a lot of people in, in federal government that were more than happy to send your kid to Vietnam to live and die and fight in a war they didn't believe in. And their kids got to stay home. Uh, and so this is kind of what that song is about. It's Fortunate Son, Fortunate Son by Credence Clearwater Revival. It is among John Fogarty's greatest creations. That's your number five song, Fortunate Son. Uh, number four, I don't even like this song that much, to be honest with you. Uh, I am not a big Who fan. Many of you have asked me to do a top ten Who list. It just makes my stomach turn, man. I just, I really don't like the Who. Uh, wasn't a big Pete Townsend guy. I don't think Roger Daltrey is in the same vein as many of his contemporaries as a, as a vocalist. Dave Murray is a huge The Who fan. I do like some of the songs. I can kind of tolerate this one, but I kind of prefer Pearl Jam's version. It's Baba O'Reilly from The Who. That's your number four track. I think Eddie does a great job on the vocal. Now, these next three, I think most people would probably consider these the top three. Even though a lot of people, I don't know, fully know the story behind the number three song uh, on your list. And it's Crown of Thorns. And so Crown of Thorns was written and recorded by Andrew Wood and Mother Love Bone, who were really the forerunners of the grunge movement in Seattle. And a lot of young people today, they went and bought them a Nirvana shirt at Spencer's Gifts and you know, considered themselves a definitive expert of the 1990s music. Well, I lived through all this too. So I remember you know, Screaming Trees and Green River. I remember the forerunners of grunge, the Melvins. But Mother Love Bomb was kind of making a little buzz and they would get a little blurb in, in, in Rolling Stone or in, in Spin Magazine. And then Andy died. I don't know where he died. And so Stone Gossard and Jeff Mahment, who were founding members of Pearl Jam, they were members of Mother Love Bone. And so, and I, I still have the VHS tape. I'm, I'm sure it's on YouTube now, you, the, the Mother Love Bone story. It's incredible. Andy was such a gifted performer. They didn't know what was next. And so they went out and kind of kept playing music. And then eventually a demo tape of Eddie Vedder's, I believe Eddie was based in San Diego then, somehow the demo tape made its way to Jeff Ahmed, who was really kind of the leader of the band in Pearl Jam. He's kind of the guy that kind of handles things. And Pearl Jam was born, kind of rose from the ashes of the Mother Love Bone and the Andy Wood uh, death. And we have talked about this before, about Andrew Wood. There are a lot of songs and albums out there that – I think we did a top 10 list about this. And if, if we didn't, maybe we should. Maybe roll a check for us. But there are a lot of songs and there are a lot of albums that mention Andrew Wood. Alice in Chains' first full-length album, Facelift, dedicated to the memory of Andrew Bone. Andrew Bone. Andrew Wood. Uh, the song Left Far Behind, Far Behind by Candlebox, written about Andrew Wood. I've heard Kevin tell that story directly. And they, they were kind of rivals at the time, too. The whole part about, um, I didn't mean to treat you so bad, but I did it anyway. That's not about a relationship. That's about Kevin and Andy. Because when, when Counterbox got ready to re go record their debut album, the rehearsal hall that they were sent to that got booked was Mother Love Bone's rehearsal hall. And he walks in there and kind of the ghost of Andrew Wood greets him. And next thing you know, the greatest song in the Candlebox catalog is born out of that moment pretty incredible even faster pussycat has a song about andrew wood mr star dog 
or Mr. Love Dog. Yeah, Mr. Love Dog. But, uh, you know, Tame Me Down is from the Seattle area. So, but Crown of Thorns is, uh, if you watch the movie Singles, it's a big part of that. And, uh, you know, the, the hook is, it's my kind of love. It's the kind that moves on. It's the kind that leaves me alone. It is one of those songs. My favorite Mother Love Bone song is uh, probably Star Dog Champion, uh, without question. But Crown of Thorns is one of those. You know, it starts with Chloe Dancer. There's kind of the refrain, and then there's a piano, and it kind of goes into the song. But Pearl Jam plays this regularly uh, in homage of Andrew Wood. And for those of you that don't know, that you you know Hunger Strike, right, the song with Soundgarden and and uh, Pearl Jam, you know, a lot of that stuff was already recorded before Eddie joined the band, before they, Pearl Jam was even big. Temple of the Dog had already been released, and it got revitalized, of course, when Pearl Jam became huge. And Hunger Strike was the first thing that Chris and, and um, Eddie had on, ever worked on together. That whole album is dedicated to the memory of Andrew Wood. Very, very, very influential guy in the grunge scene. And sadly, his story is getting lost uh, due to blabbermouth and and all these loud wire and all these people that want to rewrite history and tell you things that weren't true but crown of thorns and mother love bone that's the cover number three uh, number two this goes back and uh pearl jam had a huge hit with this and a lot of people thought it was an original song it's not it goes back uh, decades originally written by wayne cochran it's last kiss it's a very very sad song but uh you know it's kind of got that 50s early 60s vibe to it you know kind of that radio friendly vibe and uh, last kiss was a huge 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 hit it was everywhere it put it on modern radio but number one and if you've ever seen pearl jam live and if you've ever seen them like remember when the mtv video music awards they used to actually talk about videos they trotted Pearl Jam out there, and they brought Neil Young out, and they absolutely tore the house down with rockin' in the free world. And it really introduced Neil Young to a new generation of fans. You know, I remember growing up as a kid listening to Heart of Gold and things like that and Southern Man, and, and of course, I wasn't a big Neil Young fan because I was a Leonard Skinner fan. But the reality of it is, is when I heard them play rockin' in the free world together, all of a sudden I said, you know, if Pearl Jam likes Neil Young, maybe I should give him another chance. Um, I still, I'm still not over this other man thing, uh, Neil, just so you know. But rockin' in the free world, that rendition is incredible. And you can find several versions of it online. But rockin' in the free world is one of those songs, too, lyrically. And, and just, I just want to share this with you, too. One of the things that reflects in me that I respond to is authenticity. You know, I like people that write about real things. You know, there, there needs to be, you know, some whimsy in music, too. I mean, there's some silliness, too, that I, I kind of enjoy. But, you know, the greatest songs that are ever written have not been songs of no consequence. This is one of those songs, too, and, and the second verse of the song is extremely powerful. It's, it's, songs like this resonate with me. It's one of the reasons I like Rage Against the Machine and Public Enemy I like people that sing about real stuff, and this was one of those social issues thing. And um, so I'm going to just share this uh, second verse with you. I'm not going to sing it. Um, but he says, I see a woman in the night with a baby in her hand. There's an old street light near a garbage can, and now she puts a kid away, and she's going to get a hit. She hates her life and what she's done to it. There's one more kid that will never go to school, never get to fall in love, never get to be cool. That is one, if that does not hit you, I don't, you need to go talk to somebody. I mean, that is the reality for a lot of people in life. And it's like you say, well, you know, Steve, people have a choice. You know, until they don't. You know, think about the kid. The kid never chooses who to be born with. And, you know, and it's like that stuff happens in life, in reality. But every single thing in this song, this is one of those protest-type songs that I think everybody can can get behind and I think Pearl Jam was a perfect band to cover it and I love their version with Neil Young it's just absolutely phenomenal so there you go top 10 list if you have ideas for the top 10 list reach out and let me know uh, we're happy to consider them we got a pretty good list together but we're always looking for fresh ideas always always and I told you guys too after last week man you know it's like I got to cleanse the palate we got to have rock all week this week so I got some things lined up and again it's going to be rock all week this week all week this week Reach out to me on all forms of social media at Scout Steve R. You can find Roy Samante, my friend, 
at Dogmatic, that's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7 on Spotify and Twitter. And you can keep up with those great lists. And here's the deal. Our good friend Izzy Mandelbaum, he responds to Roy's tweets with the Apple Music list. So whether you're Spotify or Apple Music, we got you covered. It's incredible what this thing has become. There's your top 10 list of Pearl Gym covers. Again, you got ideas, reach out, let me know. Some of you guys are really creative. I mean, it's like, hey, Steve, what about a list of like a band, of all bands with singers born like the second week in August? I mean, you know, are you kidding me? You know, I'm a, it's a little bit over the top. But guys, give me some great ideas, and uh, some of you ladies do as well. And so keep them coming. If we don't get to your list right away, don't take it personal. We'll get to it. There's a lot of music out there. All right, let's thank our friends at Campus Bookmart. They're like friends and family to me because they are friends and family to me. They'll be friends and family to you, too. Be sure and go by and check them out. You'll be glad you did. Stan to man, Miss Kathy Brown, a lovely, talented Susie, everybody up there. Great people doing a great job at a great price. If you can't make it to town to see their smiling faces, visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays, and that is BSR which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. And that'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. Absolutely incomplete. Again, that's campusbookmark.net. Promo code BSR. Be sure to outfit your family for the uh, colder weather in the early part of baseball season. Get those new hoodies. Kids grow fast. Be sure and get one for yourself too. Campusbookmark.net. Okay, women's hoops. We... uh, Didn't have a great weekend, but here's the deal, and and I don't mean this in a negative way, and I hope that you won't misconstrue that I'm saying this negatively. I won't say that I've considered this a throwaway year, but it's like even when we lose, I'm not overly disappointed because of the circumstances that kind of surrounded the season. You know know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, Doug Novak was not hired to be the head coach, and Nikki has to leave to deal with some personal issues, and – you know, and so as a result, you know, I guess my emotional investment in this is um, it's not great. It's not that I don't want us to win. I do. I, I celebrate every victory. But I just don't get, you know, you know, remote throwing mad, you know, if we lose a ball game because I understand the circumstances these ladies are playing in. You know, Jessica Carter, our best post player, not playing this year. May return next year, not playing this year. So you lose your coach, you lose your best post player, and you have all these transfers coming in trying to form a unit and play under difficult circumstances. And so it's like, to be honest with you, when we get a win, it almost feels like a bonus. You know what I'm saying? And again, that's not to say anything negative about the team. And I know people say, well, Steve, you know, just a few years ago, we were NAFL championship contenders. And you know what? You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. That's not the situation we're in now. Simple as that. And I know there's a lot of people who want to find somebody to blame. You know, the reality of it is, you know, Vic Schaefer left us. We didn't fire Vic Schaefer. We didn't run Vic off. You know, Vic left the roster that was a, kind of a challenging roster to manage. And it's a little easier when you're the person that recruited him. You know, Vic was able to kind of hold it in the road because, you know, he could pick up the phone, call the parents. He had a relationship. He'd been recruiting them for a couple of years, you know. But there were some challenges even in that last semester that, that, that Vic was here. They just did a pretty good job of managing that. You know, some of those players that left and some of the problems that you had last year, you know, a lot of that started, you know, towards the end of Vic. And that's not to be critical of Vic. I mean, you had went out and recruited some players that ended up being a little bit difficult to deal with. Now, it didn't like you had Victoria and Blair and, and uh, Tierra and them to kind of keep that, that group in line. You didn't have the same level of leadership. And so Nikki inherited a lot of that issue. And then all of a sudden, you know, hey, you know, I don't really know these kids. I don't really know these families. And so that was an issue last year. And so we have had some things that have kind of gone on that hadn't been great for us. And it's not always somebody's fault. I know we want to find somebody to blame, but it's not always somebody's fault. Sometimes things happen against us. And you know what? We got to get this higher right. We, we do. Uh, I expect us to make a higher you know, shortly after the season is over, I don't think there's any question. I know there's a, there's a lot of due diligence being done right now. But I'll be honest with you, it's not like, you know, with football, it's like as soon as 
you know, there's job openings, you start getting names mentioned. You know, the, the women's basketball circles are a lot smaller. There's just not a lot of people out there that cover the game on a national level. Like, you can't go out there and find a whole lot of lists. Okay, who are the top 20 rising coaches in women's basketball? Who are the top 20 young coaches in women's basketball? You don't. We kind of know who the, the, the cream of the crop is, but you don't always know the up-and-comers. And so, in many respects, there's some guesswork involved in this, and you've got to do your own due diligence. Uh, but the Lady Bulldogs have lost three in a row. You know, we, we weren't surprised that we lost to Ole Miss. We hated it. Ole Miss is better than us. Simple as that. They are better than us. Can we play better? Yeah, we can. But uh, we got ambushed up there by a better team. That's just kind of the reality of life. And, and it pains me to say that, but that's just the truth. Georgia, a better team than us, too, in some respects. But uh, they get the big lead, and we come back and actually had the lead with under a minute to go. And then we lose by 20 in Fayetteville. And, uh, you know, Arkansas has always been a tough place to play, even when we had great teams. But this was the game, you know, at the half. And then Arkansas overwhelms us in that third quarter, a 32-17 advantage in the third period. It's difficult to come back from double digits in one period of basketball. It really is. Anastasia Hayes, 17 points from Mississippi State. Katerian Thompson with 11 off the bench. Uh, Danae Carter, of course, back in action. Just a two points for her, but she pulled down eight boards. Also had three blocks. So, you know, we'll see how things progress with this team. But, again, you know, I want to compete on all fields and courts of play. It's important to me. I know it is to you guys as well. But I'm not going to get all, you know, ranting and raving this year about women's basketball. I'm, I'm just not. I'm happy when we win. I'm disappointed when we lose. But I'm not angry at anybody when we lose. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to text the Doug Novak and say, Doug, you're a bum. I mean, come on. This is, the guy's doing a job he wasn't hired to do. He'd not, to my knowledge, he had never been the head coach on the women's side. He had he'd coached the men. He'd been an assistant coach before, but he'd – and this is a new undertaking. He said, well, basketball is basketball. Well, not exactly. You're not exactly. And so everybody, I believe, is doing the best they can. And so I'm, you know, I'm not going to get out there and be critical of them. I'm just, I'm just not. I'm not going to do it. We get Missouri this Thursday in Humphrey Coliseum. Interesting Missouri team. You know, they beat South Carolina this year. And that's one of the things, too, you get. I give Missouri a lot of credit. They have found a way. If they can ever get Don Staley and the Gamecocks in their yard, they're going to give them trouble. I mean, they, they are. You know, there are some teams out there that kind of have your number. You know, South Carolina does a good job, you know, uh, at home. But Missouri, for some reason, when they get, when they get Don Staley – and Lady Gamecocks, it elevates that crowd. I mean, it did with us when we were in there too, you know, but the reality of it is, is there have been some pretty good Missouri teams, not great teams, that have beaten the Gamecocks. Looking at the uh, women's basketball standings right now too, it's one of those things too, you kind of look at this and you just kind of ask yourself, you know, you know how, I mean, how fair is it, you know, to be all upset with uh, – with anybody involved in any of this stuff. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's not. It, it's not one of those things that I think you can get. And there's nobody out there that you just look at and say, you know what, hey, I don't think you're giving your best. I mean, at, at this point, I think Rakia Jackson has given us what she has, trying to carry the team. Got a pretty good supporting cast around her, but against some of the teams that we're competing against, we, we don't have the talent. Uh, so, last place in the league is uh, Auburn, 0-6, 8-9 overall. That's Johnny Harris's team. We wish Johnny the best, but uh, things not off to a really good start there on the Plains. A&M, you know, Gary Blair's announced his retirement. They're 1-6 in the league, 11-8 and overall. Vanderbilt, 1-4, 10-9. And, and, and this Vanderbilt team has been more competitive. They're just not winning very much. Kentucky, a game that got rescheduled, and uh, I don't think they've announced the date yet, but it got postponed for us. We'd like to get this Kentucky team, 1-4, 8-7. and seven. Should be a game we can win. Uh, two and six for Alabama, eleven and eight overall. Mississippi State just above them at two and four, and of course we got a couple games to make up. Arkansas three and three, thirteen and six overall. Missouri four and three, fifteen and five overall. Georgia four and three, Florida five and two in the league. LSU five and two. Ole Miss five and one. South Carolina five and one. Uh, Tennessee seven and zero. Oh. And here's the thing too. Let me go ahead and prepare you for this. Good chance Ole Miss ends up hosting. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead and get ready for it. I know that's kind of been our thing, you know. And then, but Ole Miss is in a pretty good position now. now they're going to have an opportunity if they continue to win 
to host. But what happens, you know, the rest of the way? I mean, they have kind of beaten up on some mediocre teams. They've got some good teams ahead of them. Uh, took care of Kentucky over the weekend. Kentucky was ranked, but uh, Kentucky's kind of riding that preseason ranking, to be honest with you. They have, they're not an elite team. We'll find out about Ole Miss pretty quick, though. They're going to be at South Carolina. Then they host Georgia. Then they travel to Missouri. And then they host LSU before they come to Starkville. So that's four pretty difficult games right there. You say, well, it's number one. I mean, it's three ranked opponents. And then Columbia, Missouri is a very difficult place to go play. For whatever reason, it is a difficult place to go play. They get up and they are ready to play in big games. You give them a lot of credit uh, for putting together a good atmosphere up there. And so I look forward to a day that we do have more of an emotional investment in women's basketball. But I think most fans right now are just like, you know what? I'm going to cheer for us when we win. I hope we always do. And if we don't, it's unfortunate. But it's not what it once was. But I, I am not one of these people that believe that our best days are behind us. We have had some amazing times with Vic Schaefer. I don't think we have to, uh, you know, kind of regress to what we were, you know, in the 80s and 90s. I think we have an opportunity with the right hire to kind of get back on the national stage. Does that mean that we're – Competing for an AFL championship? I mean, I don't know. We've only done it twice in our history, but we've done it in our recent history, and it's whet our appetites to the point that we want more. We got so close and should have won. We should have beat Notre Dame, and that's the thing we look back in hindsight and said, you know what, if we had won that, you know, maybe things would be a little different today. I don't know that, but it would be nice to have that trophy, to say the least. Let's thank our good friend uh, Brooks Bryan and the group at Portico. Doing a great job, man. Love those folks to death. Portico is a new residential development just on the outskirts of Stark Vegas. You turn off 82 on a 12, the very first ride is Pat Station Road. That'll take you to Portico. It's just 1.1 miles from the Mississippi State campus and within a thong, stone's throw of the Walmart neighborhood market uh, just across the highway there. So if you're running short, you're running late, you can run through there and pick up something quick to eat. You can get up a two-bedroom, two-bath home up to a four-bedroom, four-bath home and be excited that you have it. Brand new construction. Everybody deserves that at least one time in their life. And that's the thing, too. Phase one's completely sold out. Phase two, about to get all that rolling now. The roads have been established and you're kind of getting things going. But you can have some say in picking your lot and picking your house plan. You can pick that out today and be glad you got it. Pretty exciting to think about you know, what those options are. Uh, So Blair can help you with the mortgage side of it. Brooks can help you with the selection side of it. So let me give you Brooks' personal cell number two. Brooks, of course, played uh, baseball at Mississippi State, made a big catch, big catch to send us to Omaha, robbed a home run against the University of Washington to send us to Omaha. So for that reason, that reason alone, you owe him the opportunity to sell you on Portico. Give him a call or text today at 601-416-8075. Again, at 601-416-8075. And here's the deal. Whether this is your primary residence, maybe a future retirement home, maybe an investment property for you, or maybe just your ball game weekend retreat, you're going to be glad that you made the move to Portico. If I was moving to Starkville now, I would move to Portico. I like the convenience to being close to campus, but also, too, you're on the quiet side of campus. So you're not dealing with all the traffic and the hustle and bustle on that side. And you're, you're, kind of, you're off the highway anyway. I like it. You will too. Make Portico your next move. All right, so we've talked a little bit about recruiting. Of course, on Friday, you know, Stephen Lasoya made it official. Uh, he'll be in classes today. Uh, pretty good deal. We get that thing done. And now we're basically down to three spots. We haven't brought in any official visitors the last two weekends. And people panic a little bit. But here's the deal. We got three spots. Three spots, and we may not take three guys on between now and National Signing Day. We might wait and save a grant or two, as we've talked about on the show, to see what happens in the portal in the spring. So rather than kind of regurgitate the same talking points we've had the last couple of days, I thought let's look ahead and let's talk a little bit about 2023 recruiting. You say, well, Steve, I'm just kind of getting used to this. Well, your Bulldogs have already picked up two big-time recruits for the 2023 class. Ty Jones out of Bay Springs High School. If you haven't watched his film, you owe it to yourself to go do it. Nearly ranked a 91 composite on 247 Sports. Ty is the real deal, guys. His name is Tyrick Jones. This guy can really, really play. 
early offers from state, Arkansas State, Indiana, Ole Miss, Southern Miss. We'll probably not add a bunch more, you know, unless some blue blood's coming on him, and they, they certainly may. They may. I like his game a lot. 6-1-205 from Bay Springs, Mississippi. They're also the Bulldogs, in case you didn't know. What's interesting, too, you know, there's a lot that's got to be done, you know, with this, um, you know, with these rankings this early in the process. So, so I don't put a lot of emphasis on the rankings just yet. You know, both of the players that are committed to Mississippi State currently ranked in the top 10. Ty Jones, number two. Number two. They have Centurion Perkins from Raleigh, who is committed to Ole Miss, and I expect him to stay committed to Ole Miss. They've got just some people in that area, of course, that are huge Ole Miss folks. And so Dante Moncrief's success, you know, kind of helps in that respect. I mean, a lot of people think, hey, it was good enough for Dante. It's good enough for us. I don't know that I agree, though, that Santorin is the number one player in the state. He may be. He may be. Uh, he is certainly a top five player in the state. And, uh, again, we're just still kind of reviewing, you know, film. There's some guys that I really like. But Ty Jones is one of them. If you're unfamiliar, let me help you a little bit here. Uh, Ty Jones is a junior, played in 10 games, 153 carries, 1,228 yards. That works out to an average of eight yards a carry. Even on a high school level, that's impressive. Average 122.8 yards per game, a long of 72 had 600-plus yard games and 18 touchdowns out of the backfield. Didn't catch a lot of passes, though. That's the thing you, you, you think at. You know, the dynamic has changed a little bit when it comes to Mississippi State recruiting running backs. And not a lot of these running backs polish out, round out that aspect of their game. Only had a couple receptions. And so that's something they'll have to get him in camp. But what you're doing is you're recruiting the skill set. You're going out and you're recruiting the athlete. And then you'll kind of round his game out once he gets on campus. That's why you have college coaches, right? They can handle all that. And so I'm not the least bit concerned about that. I'd like to see more receptions. But some of that, too, is a product of the offense. And this is a guy that plays in one of the lower classifications in Mississippi high school football. And so as a result, you know, do you want to make him do things that you don't have to do on the high school level? You know, chances are probably not. You know, you're going to get out here and have the guy go play a game of football. But the reality of it is, is why throw it when you can run it? And, you know, if, if you're averaging five, six, seven, eight yards a carry, why would you ever throw the football, right? He also played a little bit on defense last year, 10 games played, uh, had a hand in 25 tackles, even had three and a half sacks. And that's what you expect at lower classifications. SEC guys should play on both sides of the football. They absolutely should. Uh, Bay Springs, it's a great town down there. They, have, they rarely have SEC prospects, right, to be fair. But when they've had some, Mississippi State has shown some attention. Uh, I like this get. I like it an awful lot. And if you go watch his huddle video, and uh, we'll, we'll do a scouting report probably today or tomorrow. Kind of start, I'm starting to review film on these guys so I can get a little more excited about them. Um, you're going to be pretty hyped about this guy. I think it's one of those things, too, when you look at this – this guy on film, you're going to be like, you know what, hey, Steve's right. This guy can really play. And here's the deal. We're not going to be real bullish in the running back recruiting market. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are going to be some running backs. They're going to have a little difficulty adjusting to our brand of offense. And so you got to go out there and you got to get guys that have the skill set to catch a lot of passes because we're going to get you in space. We're going to do everything we can to get you in matchups that are advantageous to you, but you're not going to carry it 25 times a game in a traditional offense. It's a completely different dynamic. And so there are going to be some running backs that will be like, nah, I don't want to play in that style of offense. And you know what? That's okay. I mean, you look at Branson Robinson. Listen, we weren't going to beat Georgia head-to-head for him anyway. But once his recruitment blew up, and we're talking the number one player in the state of Mississippi for 2022, and I love his game. I absolutely love his game. This is a guy, though, that wants to be kind of a pro-style back. He wants to be in a run-first type offense. He's going to Georgia, and uh, and I think we'll do a great job there, provided he can stay healthy. I love his game. I think he's a future pro. And you say, well, Steve, we got to keep those guys in the state. I, I get that. I certainly do. But I also know this. Running back recruiting is going to be a little different animal for us. It's not like when you Cam Makers and Colin Hill came out, you know, you're – 
you know, you say, hey, well, we'll get one of the two, and we did. But we're running a different scheme now. I don't know that you get either one of those guys in the air raid. And that's not to say we don't have great backs. We do. I mean, Woody and, and DJ are doing a phenomenal job for us. But the reality of it is, is we're going to have different running backs. We're going to have a different skill set. And so there will be some guys closer to home. They're going to stay, you know what, I'm going to go to Mississippi State. I don't care what offense they run. I don't care who the coach is. I'm going to Mississippi State. And you know what? We need some kids like that. We do. But I think when you look at this deal with, um, you know, with Ty, that may be the case. But I think, you know, he is more of what you're going to get. You're going to get these guys that are guys kind of built in the same vein as DJ and Woody because they're going to have to pass pro a lot. I think everybody knows this. If you don't, you should. And you look at Bay Springs last year, too, in case you didn't know. Uh, Bay Springs 12-1 uh, and one on the year last year. Lost an away game in week two to Scott Central and then won 11 in a row. Pretty impressive, too. And most of these games were not close. Taylorsville was a 14-12 game. Everything else, pretty much a blowout. Pretty much a blowout. So, again, you know, a great player that had a great season – on a great team in our home state they want to play running back let's go over the weekend we hosted uh you know a dozen or so prospects maybe a few more mostly in staters there were a couple of -of out-of-staters picked up the verbal commitment of joseph head out of holmes county central high school now it's the same high school kamari rogers is from right and you say well steve you know why didn't help us with kamari well you know kamari was kind of a known commodity much earlier in the process. A lot of people kind of knew he wanted to go out of state. Much different deal this time. And uh, if what I have gathered in my research of uh, Joseph Head since Mississippi State offered is that uh, from a Mississippi State family, you know, has uh, some family that have cheered for Mississippi State, you know, forever. And so Mississippi State offers, Ole Miss offers, uh, shortly thereafter. And, and listen, and let me prepare you for that too. We have gone through that before. It used to be kind of a running joke over on Gene's page that whenever we would offer a kid, and say, oh, he's got his first SEC offer. I said, well, yeah, wait a few minutes. He'll get a second one when Ole Miss offers. That's kind of how this one was too. You know, it's like we offered and they offer. And I, Dan Mullen, I give him and his staff a lot of credit. You know, when, when Dan was here, we did a great job evaluating players. And so, especially quarterbacks. So like if Dan Mullen offered a quarterback, he was going to get other offers. Whether he came here or not, he was going to get other opportunities to play college football. Um, and so I, th- I kind of see some of this in-state stuff too. It's like, you know, we've got some in-state offers out there. Then all of a sudden, state offers, and we kinda, other people kind of jump on the bandwagon. Uh, but Joseph Head is a natural – outside edge guy whether he be will he grow into a hand in the ground defensive end i don't know i guess we'll see i guess he's still a young guy right i mean you know but he's 6'4 225 right now i gotta think if those numbers hold by the time he gets in the college weight room he's gonna be a guy that's gonna be 250 so i think obviously he's probably got maybe a weak side defensive end guy a guy that's gonna play with his hand in the ground maybe he stands up in some concepts we'll see but um this is a long rangey defender that will get after the quarterback. Now, looking at his numbers from this past year, 11 games, 88 total tackles, 74 of those solo, 13 of those go for tackle for loss. Pretty impressive, right? And that's just a junior. And then you look at some, uh, you know, some other things out here with this team. You know, this is a guy, too, that's been part of a team that has been rather resurgent. You know, Holmes County Central has improved in recent years under Coach Rogers. You know, they're, they're a team that, you know, is expected to make the playoffs these days. Wasn't always the case. You know, we had, was it uh, Jay-Z George and Lexington McLean that uh, consolidated together uh, to form this high school. And, and now we're starting to see this all kind of come together. And now they're producing prospects. You know, look at last year's record for those guys. I mean, you know, again, this is just one of those teams, too. You look at it and you think, you know, there's so many athletes in that neck of the woods, how can they not be good? Well, you know, they, were, they, they weren't very good for a long time. And uh, they were a team last year that uh, kind of had a little bit of a, a, a rebuilding year and still made the playoffs. Seven and five on the year, they get beat in the first round by Lafayette. 
who was a really strong team last year. Going to be some guys on that. Go ahead and be prepared for that. There will be some Lafayette prospects this year to pop up at good old Miss, and you're going to wish we got them. Lafayette's got some talent. But, uh, you know, Holmes County Central now playing playing in a pretty strong district. You know, when you look at it, the, they're playing Neshoba Central, right? Uh, Canton's in a district, Forest Hill, Jim Hills, this Provine, Callaway, Ridgeland, Vicksburg, Lafayette in the playoffs. I mean, so, you know, they're, they're playing some teams – that have some size and some talent. And you can make an argument that most of those JPS goals at times are just kind of getting by on athleticism. But there have been some really great football players that have come from those programs. So the talent is there. They're going to play against good talent. And so when I see uh, Joseph Head's numbers, I realize you know that he is playing against teams where he is going to see players of comparable size and ability line up across from him. I like his game. I think you will like his game when you watch him. And I think he's one of those guys, too, that – I'll give you a good comparison. I suspect he is going to be one of these guys kind of like Deontay Skinner, even though he's, I think he's going to play a different position. But I think he is one of those guys that is going to commit early, that has an SEC look to him, and some people are going to go out in the spring evaluation period and they're going to say, oh, this kid's already committed to Mississippi State. Nah. No, we're not. We're not going to go chase that. That was we'll see if Alabama. I don't think he's that. I don't think he's that caliber of prospect that Alabama is going to come in here and go chase him. Now I may be wrong, but I don't think so. I think what Alabama has done on the defensive line the last few years, I just don't think they're going to go chase Joseph Head. I think that this is going to be a guy too that's going to probably pick up some G five options out there. But I don't know if you're going to see a bunch of teams going to come in here and go head-to-head with Mississippi State for a kid that's already committed. It just doesn't always work that way. And that's one thing, if he lived in Georgia, because then all you're doing is shining a light on him, right? If he's in Mississippi and his teammate Corey Ellington is on your campus and having a great experience as a true freshman, and then not to mention the, the class that Mississippi State recruited Kamari Rogers with, Despite his ACL injury, State still made him feel like a priority, brought him in for the visit, showed him a good time, uh, made him feel like he was part of his family. You know, those those things matter. You don't think that mattered to Coach Rogers, that Mississippi State continued to recruit Kamari and still treated him? Nobody treated him like he was damaged goods. There were some schools that moved on from him and dropped him. State didn't do that. That's good recruiting, even if you don't get the guy, because at some point that coach is going to have another guy. may not be his son, but he's going to have another prospect. And so when you treat people with dignity and respect, even under difficult circumstances, you get to reap the benefits of that later. And I think this is part of that. I think state number one goes out and signs Corey Ellington, who, and I remember when I was watching his tape, I'm like, why didn't this kid have more offers? And then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, you know, this kid's overrated, blah, 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 blah. And then he plays a true freshman. And Zach Arnett, middle of the year, we were talking this one day out of the blue. I can't remember who asked the question. So, have there been any defensive guys that have stood out recently? Yeah, Corey Ellington. Next thing you know, the guy's on the field. And so, if I'm Joseph Head, I'm thinking, that, well, hey, you know, Mississippi State signed Corey, and he played as a true freshman. And, hey, Kamari Rogers is my buddy. And you know what? Even after he tore his ACL, Mississippi State still recruited him like a blue chip. Maybe they're good people at Mississippi State. Maybe they know what they're doing. Oh, Mississippi State wants me to go? Okay, let's go. Let's go. And so those are the things, too, that go in. Because everybody thinks, well, you know, they get to offer. There is more to it. Recruiting is about relationships. And many of these, especially in-state, are long-standing relationships. They know the caliber of people that we have at Mississippi State. You don't think that every high school coach in the state of Mississippi knows Tony Hughes? Most of them have probably had Tony Hughes sitting across their desk in their own office. And so when Mississippi State offers, you're like, hey, well, you know, here's the thing. As a high school coach, I can go tell that mom, hey, you know what? I don't know how you feel about these people. I don't know what you know about Mississippi State, but let me tell you our experience. You know, we had – you know Corey. He went up there and had a good experience. But last year, man, when so many of these other schools, uh, you kind of moved on from Kamari and just like well, whatever, you know, Mississippi State still made that guy feel like a big deal. You know, those are the kind of things that add up and build some currency over time. That's just the reality of life. 
And so when you do that kind of stuff, you know, and sometimes you got to drop somebody and you got to do it in the right way. And even then, sometimes it hurts some feelings. But you don't do it, you know, at the very end. You do it when the guy has an opportunity to go somewhere else and you got to handle it kind of delicately. But when you have these situations come up like this, that's how you get Joe Head. You know, it kind of helps that, you know, many of his family had always hoped he'd play at Mississippi State, but it makes it so much easier to commit when people around him have already had a positive experience with you. It's great. And so I think we're off to a great start. I'll be honest with you. I think that State is going to do really well in the trenches in State in 2023. I really, really do. I expect State to keep most of these offensive and defensive linemen together. Uh, I, I think most of these guys are going to end up like Malik Ellis at Laurel. If you're Malik Ellis at Laurel, I know you're going to have some opportunities, and the Laurel kids at times kind of stretch things out. But when you see the experience that Charles Cross had at Mississippi State, before you even make your decision, he's going to be a first-round draft pick and get millions of dollars, and he'll be rolling back into your town driving a Jaguar or something. You can say, well, hey, I had some friends go here and go there, but here's a guy that, oh, he, he played for Coach Mason Miller, and he's still there, and he's driving – He's driving an exotic automobile. I want. I want to drive. I want to drive a Porsche too. I don't want to just rent one. I want to buy one. And maybe that's our new marketing campaign, right? Maybe maybe we get uh, Charles Cross to send us a picture in front of a Porsche that says, "Hey, you could ride around in the rental Porsche, or you could buy your own." Kind of Mississippi State. But I think the state's in good shape with Malik Ellis. I, I really do. And so you know, and then there's Zay, of course, at at, uh, at Tupelo. I mean, I, again, I think state is going to do well in the trenches on both sides line of scrimmage in state this year. I'm really close to popping off a bunch of crystal ball picks. I like to do that at the beginning of the year. And people are always like, well, Steve, what have you heard? Well, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of people. I do. But sometimes I just like to get out first. I like to get out first. Now, I'll change it. You know, if I hear something that's adverse like last year, I, I, I thought Branson Robinson was going to state because he was saying privately to other people that he was going to Mississippi State. And I don't think he or I, either one, knew at the time that his recruitment was going to blow up and he was going to be considered one of the top running backs in the country. And you know what? Good for him. Absolutely good for him. But there are some prospects in this state that I feel like State's got a really good chance to get. And there's some other ones that I think Ole Miss already has some pretty good connections with that they're going to get. But I do think this is a year that Mississippi State can get the majority of – the better in-state prospects. And I think we've got to make them feel like a priority, and we've got to have these other guys out here recruiting and working for us. we got to have that esprit de corps within the recruiting class. Got to get those guys out to these events and get them to camps and things like that, get these guys interacting with each other on social media. But I like the two building blocks. Uh, of course, Ty's already rated a four-star, number two player in the state, and uh, Joseph Head is uh, a composite player. I guess he's not a composite yet, but he's a middle-level three-star. I think that's a little bit low. I think he's probably 88, 89. But I think that he is a guy that's going to be you know, a really good player at Mississippi State, and I think that we're going to have a lot to feel excited about. I really think we have a chance to have a really good year in-state. Can we supplement out-of-state? Well, we're a little bit deficient with the in-state crop. That kind of remains to be seen. That's the real challenge. That's the real challenge. You know, And uh, I, I think what we have to do in many respects – is go get the guys we're sure about right now in state, and the ones that want to commit, go ahead and take them. Now there are a lot of them are going to say, "Hey, coach, the process is just starting. I haven't been in junior days," and you're right. But between now and say the end of April, I think you can make uh, make a run on some of these guys, especially with the in state guys you have connections with. I think it's good to get the ball rolling, and I think we've already begun to do that. And I think getting Joseph Head over the weekend was a big part of that. There are a lot of people out there that understand. While we don't have the cutest hashtags, we will recruit your in-state players. We absolutely will recruit them and we'll educate them. And they'll leave here with a degree. And if they're good enough, they'll get a chance to go play in the National Football League. You know, you can have all the hashtags you want. You know, we'll have guys with diplomas and then a chance to drive some, uh, some cool cars someday. Listen, that's going to do it for today. Thanks so much for your time and your effort and your support of the Boneyard. If you're looking for books, you can find uh, – Four of them at dogpiledabook.com. You can get Flim Flam, Stark Villains, and Alpha Dogs, as well as the forthcoming Dogpile at that website. Blooms of Oleander available through Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, and many other places. And if you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you get it at starkvillains.com. 
love the fact that so many people have, uh, have, have bought those items. It's pretty cool. And it's actually trademarked. I don't know why we don't have the little TM on there, but I actually own the trademark to Stark Villain. And uh, love to see those shirts out there at Duty Noble Field and Davis Wade Stadium. Uh, you can get T-shirts, hoodies, in a variety of colors and styles. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we'll make more friends than enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.